Welcome to our presentation today. My name is Bryce Christensen. I'm the Director of Services here at Golden Helix. And on behalf of our entire company, I would like to welcome you to today's presentation about genetic data visualization and analysis with the Golden Helix family of software products. If we happen to have anyone joining us today from the state of Utah, I'd like to wish you a happy Pioneer Day. I did my grad school training in Utah, and it was always nice to look forward to a day off on July 24th. And so thank you for taking time on your holiday to join us. So as we go along today, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to type them into the question pane that is there in the GoToWebinar software. And our staff will be monitoring the question box if possible. They may answer your questions along the way, but otherwise, we will take some time at the end of the presentation to answer as many of your questions as possible. During today's presentation, we'll be featuring our two primary software products that we produce here at Golden Helix. Of course, we will be featuring our SNP and Variation Suite, or SVS software. SVS is really a broad-ranging tool for management and analysis of all different types of genomic data. The core features of SVS include not only powerful data management, but also rich visualizations, robust statistics, and it's also extremely flexible and allows you to work with all different types of data. SVS can be used in a variety of different applications. Today, though, we'll primarily be focusing on the tools available for RNA-seq differential expression analysis, as well as DNA sequence analysis and annotating and prioritizing variants for follow-up. Our other software package that we'll be featuring today is Genome Browse. Genome Browse is our 100% free tool for viewing all different types of genomic data. We initially released Genome Browse about a year ago. It has received rave reviews in the time since then. We designed Genome Browse to have a feature set similar to tools like IGV that is capable of viewing and interacting with sequence alignments in BAM files and other types of annotation data. But we tried to design it with a user interface more like Google Earth, something that is very intuitive, easy to use with simple uh, scrolling, panning navigation tools. And so we'll be looking at Genome Browse quite a bit today, especially because we've recently added several new features into the product that make it even more powerful and useful than before. So in today's agenda, there's going to be three major parts, and it's going to be almost entirely based on live interactive demonstrations with the software. For the sake of full disclosure, I'll let you know that everything I'm doing today is on a mid-range commodity desktop computer, i5 processor with eight gigs of RAM. We get the question a lot, you know, what are the system requirements? I'll tell you in advance that we do support Mac, Windows, and Linux. So as we go through, I'll start out by just walking through Genome Browse, highlighting the Genome Browse experience from the perspective of a new user, but along the way, I'll point out some of the new features that have recently been added. And I'll tell you right now that the major things that have been added since the original release include support for directly viewing VCF files and bed files, as well as a really useful tool for generating a table of data based on the genomic data that you are viewing within the visualization tool. From there, we'll move on and show two different examples of how SVS and Genome Browse can work together to create synergy in an analysis workflow. And for those examples, we'll first look at an RNA-seq analysis project, and then we'll go on to look at a DNA sequencing project based on somatic mutation analysis from a gastric cancer sample. So with that, let's go ahead and open up the software and take a look at it. So we'll close down PowerPoint and open up Genome Browse. So when you first open Genome Browse as a new user, you'll generally see an empty screen that looks something like this with this ominous add button sitting right here in front of you, just tempting you to click on it. We'll go ahead and click that. 
and see what happens. Now, if you happen to be an SVS user, you probably have a library of annotations that you have downloaded to view and interact with in SVS. All of your SVS annotations are also viewable within Genome Browse. So I see right here immediately in the list of data sources I have available to add, the complete list of everything that's currently available on my computer from my SVS annotation library. You'll also notice there are cloud-based data sources available. So this blue icon with the cloud on it indicates that from data.goldenhelix.com, our cloud-based data server, you can get a lot of the same annotations as well as some that you may not have already. And it's also integrated with EA pipelines. So if you are a customer of EA's sequencing services, you do have the option of having your data delivered to you over the cloud. We can interface directly with their system. Base space integration is coming soon, I'm happy to announce. And then also there is some example data readily available on the cloud. We'll be looking more at this a little bit later on. But right now, what I have, is a set of VCF files sitting in a directory on my computer. And I really want to start out by seeing that data. So if I go back to the Add button, I need to begin by just telling Genome Browse where my data is stored. So I'll add a path to the source directory. Here it is, it's already in my recent memory, that's good. And give it a token name. And I should now see the data in that directory available to plot. So I can recognize there are a handful of variant map files that recognizes it's something containing variant data. In this case, it's VCF files. And I have three different VCF files pertaining to this 1000 Genomes Project sample. Now, I also have on a different remote network drive, BAM files for the same sample. And just to complete the rest of the picture here, I'd like to add in my reference sequence and a gene track for the same genome alignment. So I'll add all this to my project. We see it very quickly fills in. So let's talk about what we are viewing here and how we can interact with it a little bit. So across the top, we immediately see this is the data from the BAM file. If I stretch it out and maybe pick an area to zoom in a little bit, we see that the BAM file is displayed in a two-level visualization. So at the top, we have this read depth histogram, which is giving me an idea of the overall coverage. The green and blue represent the read direction so I can recognize strand bias immediately just by looking at the relative balance of green and blue up here in the top. As I zoom in closer, I get to the point of actually being able to see individual reads and also see the individual variant calls. So variants are highlighted here in the main read view as being a different color from either the green or blue individual reads. Also, up here in this coverage depth histogram view, if I zoom in a little bit closer, we can see that by clicking here, well, actually just by mousing over, I see that there's relative depth of the T allele at 36, the C allele at 27. By clicking on it, I get more detailed information from the BAM file. So I can see, again, 36 reads for the T allele that matches the reference sequence, 27 for the alternate allele here of the C and the mean quality scores for both alleles. If I zoom in a little bit further, I get to the point of being able to see the individual bases within each read, and I can click on reads to get all of the detailed data from the BAM file, including individual base quality scores and other very useful data. Now if I zoom back out a little bit and look at a wider view, one thing that can sometimes be helpful with this type of data is not only to see the overall, whoops, that's not the button I wanted quite yet, we'll get to that one, but I have the ability to change the view. So instead of emphasizing the mismatches, so all these little colored blocks representing a non-reference allele, what if what I really want to highlight is just the strandedness? 
Or what if I want to actually split the data by strand? So I see forward strand reads above the axis, reverse strand below. And this can help me in many cases to recognize strand bias, other coverage issues in the data. And then also one that's very useful, especially if you're looking at structural variants and CMVs, is to view it in the context of paired ends. So we'll switch to the paired end view here for a moment and look at this. And so zooming in on paired ends, we can see that in general we have a blue read on the forward strand connecting through to a green read representing the matched pair on the reverse strand. Now in terms of zoom and navigation features, I can use my scroll wheel to zoom in and out. That's what I'm doing right now. I also have the ability to just click and drag to pan back and forth in the image. If there's too much data to show vertically, in the screen. Let me zoom in a little so we get that effect. I can also click and drag up and down. We give you the ability to scroll up and down cleanly even through very deep coverage pileups where you have a thousand or more reads covering a particular locus. Now let's look a little bit closer here at the representation of the VCF file. This data comes from the Illumina Genome Network, IGN. And as you may or may not know, IGN uses two different variant callers, and so we see both sets of genotypes represented here in this track. But as we zoom in, we recognize there's the MAX-GT, which is generally a more conservative variant caller, and the poly version. So we see both of them together, but we can click on any of these individual features and get all of the data contained in the VCF file for that particular marker set. So if we need to look back and confirm anything about quality scores or about other filters that may have been set in the VCF, that's here quickly and easily accessible. Now, one of the great new features that we're really excited about is the ability to create a table from any data view. So I see right now I have a uh, small region of chromosome 6 visible on the screen. And as I zoom out, it gets too dense to display and it turns into more of a density plot with black and gray uh, colors representing the overall density of variants. But if I want to put all that information into a table, I can just click this button and it opens up a table showing me essentially all of the fields from the VCF file in a list that can be exported, copied, and pasted into other software to use for different purposes. Now, one of the other really exciting things about this, let me just slide it over here to get it a little bit more out of the way, is that by simply clicking on any row, the view jumps to that particular feature. So I can just pick one that I'm interested in, click on it, and zoom directly to it. I can also just use the arrows on my keyboard similarly to scroll through. So we can see here, um, I thought I saw one there a minute ago where the two calling methods were different. I wanted to highlight that one, but it um, got away from me. But you get the idea that if there's something you um, are really interested in in this list, you can just click and jump directly to it and see exactly what you need to find out. Now, one other feature that is new is the ability to view BAM files in, or not BAM files, BAM files was, were an original feature, but BED files, and I have here on my desktop a BED file with a couple of interesting features relating to this particular sample. I can click and drag that BED file into Genome Browse, and it immediately appears as a track, and just like before, I can click to create a table of that, but using this start button, it shows me everything from the beginning. And I can see that I just have two different features here that I want to highlight. So if I click on the first one, it jumps to this region where we can recognize that across the width of the area, there's pretty consistent coverage depth in the sample. And then there's a small region where there appears to be a substantially higher read depth, and this was a copy number gain that was originally identified in complete genomics sequencing of this same sample, 
It's also clearly evident in this sequencing performed by the Illumina Genome Network. The other one here I'd like to highlight is a very interesting inversion polymorphism. So I mentioned that paired ends are useful when looking at structural variants. This is a nice example of that. So we can see up here in the histogram view all of these colored bars that indicate non-reference alleles being mapped to that position. And as we look down into the actual read alignments, we can start to recognize what's happening here. So typically with paired end sequencing, we have a blue forward strand read connecting to a green read on the reverse strand. But in this area, let's pan over just a little bit, we see that we have blue reads connecting to blue. Those are spanning the left breakpoint of the inversion. We also have green reads connecting to green. Those are spanning the right breakpoint of the inversion. And <clears throat> where we see these mismatches, it's reads that are actually reading right through the breakpoint. So if we were to zoom in on this particular set of reads and invert this and flip it over to the other side of the inversion, we would see that it's a continuation of the sequence on the other side. So this makes for a really nice, clearly evident pattern of an inversion and when you see this kind of uh, stacking of mismatch reads at either end of the feature. Now, I already highlighted how you can create tables of data based on a VCF file and based on a bed file. That feature is available for all types of data that can be shown. So even with the BAM file, I can create a, tabl a table view of all of the different read alignments within my visible window, together with all of the mapping quality scores, all of the individual alignment scores. And this could be potentially very useful in a number of different situations. And as I mentioned, you can um, copy and paste the entire table or various rows of the table and use it externally outside of the software. Now, finally, one last thing that I'd like to demonstrate is what happens when you have a VCF file with a lot of data in it. So if I come back to the Add button, I have a VCF file here that is one chromosome of the 1000 Genomes Project. I'd like to add that in. Now, it was just chromosome 22, so I'll need to navigate over there. But what you see, it's up here at the top, is as it initially draws in, it looks like a density plot where we have high density of variance in some areas, low density in other areas. But as we zoom more, we can get into where we start to see the individual variant features captured within the VCF file. If you're familiar with the variant map in SVS, this is a similar concept, and if we get in close enough, we can see that for individual samples, we see this one is homozygous for a T allele, this sample is heterozygous CT, the gray coloring indicates a reference allele, anything other than gray indicates non-reference allele. And if we adjust the zoom on this a little bit, we see that it does expand out to all of the 1,092 samples in the data, and just like before, we allow you to cleanly zoom and navigate through this. Clicking on features still generates all of the listing of information available from the VCF file. So in this case, it's a lot of data. Okay. So with that as a background on Genome Browse and on some of the new features that we've recently added to Genome Browse, Let's back up and open SVS for a few minutes. And we'll begin by looking at a project containing some RNA-seq data. The data that I'm showing here is a subset of the data that is freely available to our customers through the RNA-seq tutorial. It is generated by EA and is data from sequencing of several breast cancer cell lines. In this case, I have a subset of the data representing six of those samples. 
The data is in a spreadsheet where there is a marker map attached that indicates the chromosome that each of these genes is on together with the start and stop position of the gene. And for each gene, we have a quantification of the RNA expression there. I believe this is based on RSEM quantification counts. And so scrolling through, we recognize there are definitely some genes that are highly expressed, some that are very lowly expressed, perhaps expressed only in one sample at very low depth. And so to summarize this data, I previously just used the column statistics tool in SVS to get an idea of the distribution of values. So for each of the two groups, the basal tumor types and the high cloud in types, we see the minimum, median, mean, and maximum coverage for the expression. And I just like to do a simple filter where we require at least two samples out of each group to have some coverage. And since there are three samples, I can use the median value as a, kind of a cheat to do that. So if I require the median to be greater than zero on both groups, I should end up with a set of genes that I want. So I'll filter on multiple columns and choose the median for basal, the median for clodin, and activate rows that are greater than zero. This may not be the way you would always do it in practice, but it works nicely for demonstration today. And so we get a summary of which genes passed, which genes failed, and we see here that in the main data sheet there are 16,000 rows left active and a number of rows have been inactivated like rows 1, 4, and 8 because we see that the median value of 0 in at least one group. Now if I want to get this same subset of genes from the main data table, I can just use a quick tool here to apply that filter status and now I have just those same 16,000 genes active and ready to use. So I'll create a data subset of just those 16,000 genes together with the phenotype. And now I want to run a differential expression test across these genes. The test I'll use today is the DEseq method, which we have fully implemented in SVS. And I will choose just a few extra outputs and go ahead and let this run. Now the DEseq method does do its own data normalization as the first step before doing the actual association test. So we see that that part is done. It is now doing the association, generating one p-value for each of these 16,000 genes. When it's done, we'll get a nice table showing the p-values together with some other statistics related to the test. Give this just a moment. Okay, so we'll close that up. I'd like to point out here for anyone who's not familiar with SVS that the software uses a hierarchical tree structure to organize your data and keep track of your workflow. So we can see here that we started with our data, ran some statistics on it, got a report based on doing a filter. We then created a subset of the data after applying a filter and then ran the actual DEseq test and at each step along the way it's keeping detailed notes showing exactly what functions were used and what parameters were used in each function. But back here in our results we see we have our p-value column and a log 10 transform. I can sort on that column and bring up the most significant genes and we see that we definitely have some very strong signals in the data and across the rest of the table we see some other very useful technical stats. If I want to create a visualization from this, for example, I could do a volcano plot based on the fold change versus the significance of the test. Here we see a nice plot then that shows the basically the effect size or magnitude versus significance. There's a gene up here at the top that clearly comes out. I can click on it, see it's GJA1. It's the same gene that's at the top of my list here, of course. So that's really useful. Now, what if I want to go back and compare these p-values with the actual pile-up data from the RNA sequencing experiment just to confirm the pattern or look for anything unusual in the pattern, any potential sequencing errors? 
One way to do that would be to take this spreadsheet of p-values and convert it into an annotation track. As we saw earlier, Genome Browse can access the annotation library used within SVS. So if, for example, I wanted to take the top 20 genes here, I'll select those top 20, and then come to the file menu, I see I have an option to save this as an annotation track. I'll go ahead and leave it on the default name, so I'll have a track generated called p-values for conditions A and B. And all of the other statistics in the table will be included in that annotation track. So I'll go ahead and run this to create the track. We'll take just a moment. I see it's now been done. And I can come back now and reopen Genome Browse. And we'll start a new project. So we'll discard our previous work. Yes, we will be working with HG19. Okay. And this time, what we'll do is come into the Add button. And since all of this data is available through our example samples, I can choose the precise samples that I want to see the pileups for. Now I just need to get the list here from SVS so I can see it again. But I want the samples HCC 1187, 1937, and 1954, together with HS 57 and the two that start with SUM. So I can add those six samples to the project and look back now. And this time it is reading the data from the cloud. It, it's probably going a little slow today because I am uh, taking up some bandwidth with the webinar software. But what I want you to recognize is that the software has really been optimized to read data from both remote sources and local sources very efficiently and very well. Now if we look at the data that we currently have here with RNA-seq, we can maybe just look at the coverage histograms to get a pretty good idea of the expression levels. So I'll turn off the pileup views, then come back to the Add button and should see down here in my SVS annotation section the p-values from the test that we did. So I can add that in to the project. And now, just like we did earlier, create a table based on those p-values. And again, we see all of the information from the table here. And I'll just make this a little bit smaller, set it over to the side. Oh, that's as small as it's going to go. Kind of set it out of the way here. And we can jump through the features and see we're starting with this particular gene. We see it's the gene RAB25. And up here, are these first three samples. And notice they were displayed in the same order that I clicked on them. But these first three samples all have higher coverage depth, around 200, 100, 200, while the other three samples have almost no coverage at all. Then if we look back at the list and maybe scroll through some of the other features, we should see a similar pattern of very high coverage in the first half or vice versa and low coverage in the remaining samples. Now with RNA sequencing data, of course, it looks a little bit different than what we see with DNA, primarily because we're looking at data aligned to the transcriptome versus data that was aligned to the genome. But as an example of how it's displayed, just in case you're curious, let's add in the pileup for one of these samples. And, oh, this is actually a gene with one big exon. We might want to jump to one that's little more um, interesting in that regard. Okay, so here now you can see how a number of reads are spanning the splice junctions going from one exon to the next. And so if we zoom in close around the pileups, we have these gray bars and that's just indicating that a read is continuing through the intron to the opposite exon on the other side. Now, also with RNA-seq data, of course, you can recognize variants when they're present. So here it looks like we have a SNP that is homozygous, or at least it's the only one being expressed in this particular transcript. But hopefully you can see now how the fact that 
SVS and Genome Browse share a common annotation library is a very useful feature that allows us to get kind of backdoor connection between the two software packages. So I'll close this down and come back to SVS. And let's move on now to our next demonstration data set. I'd like to give you a little background on this data before we get going. So this is based on data that's publicly available from a published paper about gastric cancer. The paper was published with a report of somatic variants that were mapped originally to HG18 genomic coordinates. And data was available for download only in FASTQ format. And as an exercise in replicating results and also for our own interest in learning more about cancer variation, we downloaded the FASTQ files, repeated the alignment based this time on HG18, or sorry, HG19, excuse me, the, the original publication was based on 18. But using the HG19 coordinates, we repeated the alignment, everything was aligned using BWA together with local indel realignment, and then we tried a few different somatic variant collars on the data to compare the two BAM files, the normal BAM and the tumor BAM, to look for somatic variation. And the results that I'm showing you here are based on somatic sniper, which is one of several different variant callers that are easily accessible on the internet. Now, if we look at what we get from somatic sniper, it's actually a VCF file. And when we display VCF files in SVS, we get a table similar to this one where we see genotypes for the normal sample and the tumor sample at every position where somatic sniper determined that there may be some difference between the two sets of um, alignments. Now, <clears throat> I did some processing on this in advance. I ran the variant classification tool in SVS. And the results here give us some idea about these 455,000 potential somatic variants. We can run a summary on the results here and see that only less than 1,300 of them are in coding areas, while the remainder are either intergenic, intronic, and UTRs, and so forth. If we look at the ones that are actually inside coding regions and look at this report, and again do a summary, we see that um, there are about 732, so over half of them that are non-synonymous SNPs, a few that affect splice junctions, some that introduce new stop codons, so a lot of interesting types of variation present here. Now, Somatic Sniper also gives a lot of other interesting statistics that can be used to prioritize these results and determine which ones are likely to be true mutations in the tumor sample. And so I used a tool in SVS to collate all of the different statistics into one spreadsheet where we can look at it and get an idea about how it can sometimes be a little ambiguous and perhaps counterintuitive how some somatic variants are identified. For example, we see here in row 19 I'll highlight this one. We have a sample where the normal has over 300 reads, and about 2% of those reads correspond to a non-reference allele, but it's still being recognized as homozygous reference. But again, there's just a little bit of contamination from a non-reference allele. But over in the tumor sample, less than 1% increase, so a little less than 3% for a non-reference allele out of over 300 reads again. But Somatic Sniper is saying, you know, this could be a heterozygote. This is potentially a, a somatic mutation. So as I look at this, I think to myself, you know, I'd really like to reduce the data a little bit to the ones that are a little more obvious to me and more intuitive to me as somebody whose primary history and background is in germline mutation exactly what's going on. And also, to replicate what was done in the paper, I'd like to focus on the non-silent coding mutations. So I'll start here by just merging this big table of all of the 
marker data with the coding variant classification. So this will essentially reduce the data just to exon regions. So we'll run this merge. It'll take just a moment to complete. And we see that there are only 949 of the potential somatic mutations that are in coding regions. And you know that's less than the total 1,200. That's because somatic sniper is also picking out LOH variants where it's a heterozygote in the normal that appears to be homozygous in the tumor. And so this is just the ones that were homozygous in the normal but heterozygous in the tumor. So from this list now, I can start to apply a few more filters to get to something that is more intuitive for me to look at. So just like before, I'll use my filter on multiple columns tool. And the columns I really want to focus on are the variant classification, the overall depth and allelic ratio for the tumor, together with the overall depth and allelic ratio for the normal. So I'll get those five columns to apply filters on. And in terms of the classification, I want to keep everything except the synonymous. So we'll get non-synonymous. Unknown indicates that there's usually an issue with the reference sequence, either an unexpected early stop codon in the reference sequence or an invalid start codon. We'll go ahead and keep those because we just don't know much about what they are. And then in the normal, I want to make sure that the total depth for today's purposes is at least 10. And also in the tumor, I'll use the same thing, at least, at least 10 reads. Then, <clears throat> of course, for the normal, I also want a very low uh, percentage of the reads to be for a non-reference allele. And I'll just say less than or equal to 0 0.01. And of course, at a depth of 10, um, that means a zero. And then for the tumor, I'll flip the sign and require at least 3% of the reads to contain a mutation before I want to look at it. So we'll go ahead and run this. And I see that there were 20 that remained. I also get my report again about each variant. I just want to grab these 20 variants and take a look at them. So in each case, I see well, a lot of fairly low coverage, but some very high coverage variants here. But the allelic ratio in the normal is always very low, so little or no representation from a mutant allele, while in the tumor, it's substantially higher. Now, it's interesting to point out that of these 20 variants, looks like there's one stop gain, the rest are simple, non-synonymous. But in the original publication, this particular sample had only nine confirmed somatic variants. So we want to maybe do a comparison in genome browse of what was originally reported versus what we're finding here and see if we can recognize from the BAM files what makes the results different. So just like before, we'll go ahead and save this as an annotation track. And I'll simplify the name just a little bit. Potential somatic mutts, not comatic. Go ahead and create this. Okay. And now let's swing back over to Genome Browse. Now I already have a project ready with these samples in it. And we have the, if I remember right, the normal sample on the top and the tumor sample on the bottom. We also have the VCF file from Somatic Sniper here. Now to this, I want to add the annotation track we just created with the possible element, oh, where did they go? Potential somatic mutts, there it is. I'll add that to the project. And finally, here on my desktop, let me clean this up a little bit is a bed file with the somatic mutations originally reported in the paper. We used liftover to convert it to HD19 positions. And we should be able to look through at them now and find out what's the same and what's different.
So we'll start by looking at the re reported mutations. Go to the first one. And we see that this was in our analysis we just barely did. I can click here and see all of the statistics that we brought over from SVS all clearly spelled out. We see Somatic Sniper also identified it, so I can click here and get the rest of the information from Somatic Sniper. And we see that it was identified in the original paper, although in the bed file I didn't get any extra statistics on it other than the gene name. Now as we look closer at the data, we see why it was called as a somatic mutation. So in the normal sample, there are 74 reads. They all are for the match or the reference allele. While in the tumor sample, there are 98 reads, but 21 of them are for a mutant allele. So if we go through the list and look at some of the others, we can see this one in IL1F5 was found in the original data but not in our analysis just now, even though it was in the somatic sniper output. The reason for that is immediately obvious because the normal sample only has six reads, and I put in that filter to require at least 10. Now similarly here, the tumor sample has pretty low depth with only a total of eight reads. So I might question this one, but it is present on both strands, so it looks like it's pretty good. Now as we go through, and look at some of the others in the list, we'll find there are some that were found and reported in the original paper on this, some that were not found there, but as we compare them, or let's bring this up so we can just look at the coverage histograms, that's usually sufficient for these, we can see you know, some interesting comparisons. So this is one that was not found in Somatic Sniper at all, and if we look closer at what this is, has very high coverage depth, 242 reads for the normal. And in the tumor, 300 reads, 42 of them for the non-reference. I can't explain why this one was left out of the somatic sniper output. It looks like a pretty obvious answer. So there's just one last thing I want to highlight on this sample. So I mentioned earlier that this data was processed using um, a pipeline that included, let me find what I'm looking for, okay, right over here, a pipeline that included local indel realignment. But I want to point out how even when you use an advanced algorithm for something like local realignment of indels, you can still sometimes have problems. So I'm dragging in a bed file from my desktop, and we will Again, create a table from this and jump to the feature we want to see. Now, what we have here, let's start by just looking at the normal sample, is at first glance pretty straightforward. This purple bar indicates a deletion. And so there's a one base deletion of a T allele, and it's pretty standard to left align indels, and that's why it's over here at this first T allele. It's the earliest position it could fall in. And then a little further down we have a C to G SNP. And we can tell by looking here that they're on the same haplotype because they're always on the same read. So that read, the actual sequence of it, is a G followed by three T's and a GT. But if we look at how the tumor sample was aligned, and this was done using the exact same pipeline, they were run consecutively one after the other, the aligner made a different decision. So here, what happened is that instead of saying the T allele was deleted it, and that the C was changed to a G, it determined that the C was deleted and the T was changed to a G, but yet the actual sequence on the haplotype is identical. It's a G followed by three T's, then a G and a T. So that's just a word of caution to everyone out there that if you see a result in your somatic variant analysis pointing out a really exciting uh, frame shift indel that is present in one sample but not the other. That's what happened here. Actually it was flagged as two different um, somatic variations side by side and that's a result of the fact that I don't think somatic sniper does anything with indels. But this one looked really interesting in the original analysis, came in and looked at it and saw, wait a minute, it's 
not what it seems. It in fact is not a somatic mutation at all. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and close down Genome Browse and swing back to the slide deck for a moment. Hopefully you have seen today some ways to get synergy in your analysis, whether it's using Genome Browse alone or using Genome Browse together with SVS, or even just using SVS if you're not already an SVS user. And I'm happy to say that it's going to get even better soon. We're expecting later this year to release an updated version of SVS that will be fully integrated with the viewing interface from Genome Browse. So Manhattan plots, LD plots, everything that you love about SVS visualizations are going to be rolled forward into the new Genome Browse interface where the navigation is going to be even easier and more beautiful than ever before. So with that, I'd like to make a few acknowledgments that um, the data that you saw today is mostly from public sources, um, the sample from IGN, the gastric sample pair is from the paper listed there. Um, the RNA-seq data, as I mentioned, is all from Expression Analysis, EA, the Quintiles company. And I'd like to give a great big thank you to the Golden Helix product development team for creating a great product and also for being really responsive when I make feature requests and when our customers make feature requests. So I'd like to point out one more time that a recording of the webcast will be available on our website at goldenhelix.com tomorrow. Tell your friends about it. And with that, let's go ahead and see if you have any questions. So um, let me take a look here. All right, one question. Can we save a picture for what we see? Right now, the answer to that is that your best option is to create a screenshot. We are working on a better method for exporting graphics. I will say that in the SVS viewer interface, you do have the option of creating plots or sorry, creating and exporting graphics in a number of different formats, including PDF. Does this work for non-human species as well? That's a great question. And let me point out that whenever you start a project, you have the option of switching to a number of alternate genomes. So as you look through this list, you see everything from Baker's yeast to Norway rat, a number of different um, model organisms that get used. And if there's a particular genome you're working with that we don't have in the list, just let us know. As long as there is a reference sequence available, you can view it in Genome Browse. Um, there was a question regarding RNA-seq data in SVS. What's the input format there? Right now, the input format matches the final output from the EA analysis pipeline. It's a custom format that we can describe to you. We're also working on support for more specific formats from different methods. Maximum number of samples for RNA-seq data analysis. Um, that is a really good question. As far as I know, there is no maximum number for running DE-seq. As far as visualizing within the browser, the maximum is just a practical limit of what you can fit on the screen. I don't think we have any hard-coded limit to the number of BAM files you can view. What I showed earlier today was six. I've definitely had 15, 20 or more BAM files viewing simultaneously in the same project before. Um, moving down, how to add a new genome sequence to the genome browser. So if it's a sequence that we support, you can get to it through the add menu and through the cloud-based annotation. So you simply need to specify here from the list the species that you're looking for. So you can sort on species, come down. At the moment, I think that I am limited to only showing human, but you can change that, look at other um, okay, here it is. I'm hiding anything except my current default genome. So if I want to get a sequence for a different species, I can just get to it right here. So um, 
All right. A few more questions. How about the performance of genome browse to handle about 10 gigabyte BAM files? I will say that that whole genome BAM file we were looking at at the very beginning today was over 100 gigabytes. 10 gigabytes is not a problem. I will say that the first time you try to display a BAM file, the software does do some background computation on it that will allow it then to do some of the rapid navigation across features that we saw. So it um, calculates a, a special coverage file that we use in the background there. Um, could we do any modification on the volcano plot, such as font, color, mark shape? You can definitely change the color and shape of the marks. You can change the axis labels. You can change the scale. You can't change fonts right now. Uh, can we upload our own reference sequence or do you need to preload it? That's something that would be a great question for our support team. Um, if we don't already have your reference sequence available, it's probably best if you get some help from our team to make sure that it's properly formatted to go into the software, but you should be able to do it on your own as well. Um, what is the configuration of your laptop? So I mentioned this at the very beginning today. I'm not actually using a laptop for today's presentation, but if you want to know exactly what I am using, it, <clears throat> okay, here we are. So just for the sake of full disclosure, one more time, I'm using an Intel i5 desktop with 8 gigs of RAM, nothing special, but we do support <clears throat> Windows, Mac, and Linux for all of our software. There was a question about how to get Genome Browse. If you go to our website at goldenhelix.com and look under Products, Genome Browse, it takes you directly to the page where the download links are at the bottom. So you can see download links for 32 or 64-bit Windows, a couple different flavors of Linux, Ubuntu, or RHEL, as well as Mac. And um, Let's see, so another question, can I add Galaxy BAM files to Genome Browse? We support BAM files from all sources. As far as I know, there is no problem with a BAM file coming from Galaxy. We've worked with BAM files from just about every alignment program out there, whether it's um, BWA, Nova Align, or whatever your favorite one is question that's come up a couple times now, could we set the same scale for read depth crossing different samples in Genome Browse? That's um, a bit of a tricky question, but it is possible. The issue there is that Genome Browse auto scales the depth on plots, but you can um, lock it to a particular depth. So here, notice I'm showing about 70 to negative 70 in this bottom plot. Let's shrink this up a little so you can see the whole thing. Um, and get onto a similar scale in both the top and the bottom. I guess to do that what I need to do is unlock it, adjust the scale, or maybe adjust the one on the bottom. Once I get to a something that's similar between the two, then I can scroll across and they will both be locked to the same aspect ratio so I can get a pretty good idea of uh, what's similar and what's not. So I still don't have them exactly lined up, but <clears throat> looks like it's pretty similar there at that point. So they're they're both showing the same thing. All right. Um, would it deal interpret correctly polyploid data? In terms of viewing the alignment files from polyploid, it's not going to be a problem. The issue with SVS is that SVS is designed only to work with diploid marker data. We do have some customers who have found ways to um, recode data using different genetic models, for example, forcing things to a, a dominant model, whether there's one copy or five copies of the minor allele in a hexaploid system. And working with it in that regard, statistically, may not be the best way to do things, but it's a workaround that is available. Um, 
question here, what are the different somatic mutation detection algorithms, programs implemented in SVS? Honestly, there are no somatic detection algorithms implemented directly in SVS. If you're doing somatic mutation analysis with cancer samples, you need to use a third-party software to do the actual detection. There are a number of different packages out there. Um, I don't want to give any um, endorsements here. I did use Somatic Sniper today. Others include Varscan2, Bambino, um, and there's a EB call, I think it is, is a newer Bayesian algorithm I stumbled onto recently that looks interesting, although I haven't actually tried it out yet. Um, Mutect is another one. There's a lot of options for doing it, and if you'd like to talk more about that, let us know. Um, <clears throat> and so, just to emphasize, again, someone asked, is Somatic Sniper a new addition to SVS? It is not within SVS, I just use Somatic Sniper to create the BAM file, or not the BAM file, to create the VCF file, which I read into SVS for further analysis. Okay, um, I think we've pretty well covered most of the questions here. Um, there is a one more here. I, I need to select variants scattered evenly throughout the chromosome. Would I be able to do that with SVS? That's an interesting question. One option you have in that regard in SVS is to use the LD pruning tool, which will help you to identify a set of variants that are largely independent from one another and fairly evenly distributed, you would hope. If you actually want to systematically pick a variant every 100 KB or something like that, that's something we could work with you on and probably implement a method using our Python extensions. Um, another question, can you visualize BAM files generated from MySeq? Absolutely. Again, we are agnostic in terms of the source of your alignment data. And a question, can we have access to the EA pipeline? Um, yes. <laughs> Um, we're happy to talk to you about how that works, or you can also go through EA with that particular question. All right, and one last question here. Using alignment of multiple species, e.g. differential expression in homologous cell types. In Genome Browse, that is going to be a problem simply because Genome Browse requires that all of the plots that you're viewing at any one time are aligned to the same reference genome. And um, it's an interesting question that um, we may or may not be able to help you with further down the road. I'm thinking of ways that you could have um, two different genome browse windows open to be able to compare things indirectly. But we'll, we'll work on that. That's a good question. Finally, EA is short for what? Um, EA, I believe, is their official name now. It used to be Expression Analysis, but they've shortened to EA, and they are a subsidiary of Quintiles. All right. So thank you once again for all of your time and attention today. It's been a pleasure to share some of our new product updates with you, and I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you.